Flavia. I'm one of the organizers of Perth Green Rings. And uh, my partner, Susan Broughton, unfortunately could not be here tonight. Um, um, she was actually the one who came up with the idea to have our dear mayors talking at Green Drinks, so it's really unfortunate that she cannot be here. Um, she's usually the one who does the introductions, so um, we miss you, Susan. <laughs> um, on behalf of myself and Susan, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Central Institute of Technology, in particular the market marketing people at Central. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Central Governing Council, Council Member Colin Campbell Fraser and uh, Mr. Jamie McAway. Um, also, would like to thank you all for coming, for coming tonight to discuss such an important topic. We are just delighted to have as, as speakers tonight the Lord Mayor of Perth, Lisa Scafidi, and uh, the Lord of Fremantle, um, Brad Hedgeley. <laughs> He's just a mayor. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come, both of you. Uh, we know how busy you are, so we really uh, appreciate your presence here today. Um, we are going to be talking about cities tonight. Um, in the recent past, Australian cities have managed to absorb rapidly growing populations increasing demands on public facilities and infrastructure, changing mobility patterns, and significant technological innovations. While all these elements continue to exist, our cities now have a new huge challenge to accommodate significant climatic change while maintaining their livability and functionality as urban systems. We hope to hear tonight a bit about how Perth and Fremantle are planning to tackle this challenge. We will have 10 minute presentations by both mayors, followed by time for questions and answers. And afterwards, as always, this is Perth Green Drinks. Grab a drink, um, have a little bite, and let's network. Um, Professor Len Stumi, uh, Chair of Central's Govern Governing Council, will do an official welcome and introduce our first speaker, the Lord Mayor of Perth, Lisa Scafidi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all honoured guests here today at uh, Central Institute of Technology, our East Perth campus. We're delighted to have you here. Our special guests tonight, of course, um, are Lord Mayor, <laughs> uh, Lisa Scafidi, and the Mayor of Fremantle, uh, Brad Pittett. And we are truly honoured to have you both here, and we're looking forward to this unique opportunity, I think, this evening. I'd like to just spend a moment or two uh, giving you a little context about uh, what it is that we're doing here at Central. As I said, this is the East Perth campus. Uh, we also have, of course, a major campus in Northbridge, uh, within the centre of the city itself. Uh, Central Institute of Technology, in one form or other, has been a most important part of Perth now for about 115 years. Uh, initially is the Perth Technical College and of course uh, in, our, in our current form, as, or our previous form as, as Central TAFE and now as Central Institute of Technology. And on the way we've um, cast off, if you like, uh, Curtin University of Technology, which is again now cast off the University of Technology bit to become Curtin University itself. So there's a proud history behind um, the Technical College Institute of Technology uh, label that applies to the central body in Perth. Um, our aim really is to be an institute both in the city and for the city. By that I mean that we want to demonstrate in a very explicit way that we want to be part of, we are part of, and wish to contribute further to the life of this city. I don't know whether you realise it or not, but there are well in excess of 20,000 students at our Northbridge campus alone. Uh, these are students within the centre of the city most days of the week. Both the MRA and the City of Perth have been very supportive in our efforts to create an inner city precinct, an education precinct, 
based on our Northbridge campus, one that not only enhances life for our students and staff, but also one that the community can be part of, feel that, uh, that they want to be part of and enjoy it along the way. We, we, we're looking at the student learning precinct along with the cultural knowledge uh, part of the city itself. The aim was incorporated into a master plan recently drawn up by the City of Perth, which details how our Central's precinct in Northbridge can become an integral part of the cultural centre. We're delighted to be the ongoing uh, sponsor, or an ongoing sponsor, for these Green Drinks events. Our commitment to sustainability as an institute is perhaps best illustrated by the planned construction of our Green Skills Centre here in East Perth that's set to open in 2014. And it'll open where, just over on the other side over there, where there's a basketball ring. And uh, we begin that in, in 2014. But in the interim, of course, students are, are still in the process of acquiring the skills and the knowledge they need to be able to help us uh, build the sort of city that we're looking at. The facility, though, will allow for the delivery of high-level green skills focusing on skilling the industry cent sectors central to Australia, creating a low-carbon economy, engineering, building and the environment. Very exciting for us and we hope exciting for Perth. To tell you more about this now, it's with great pleasure I hand you over <coughs> to Mayor Lisa Scafidi to talk to you a little more about how the city is beginning to tackle these sustainability uh, problems and situations. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you to Lance and good evening, everybody. I would also like to acknowledge my good friend, the Mayor of Fremantle. There's always a lot of conjecture about how close we are. We are really close friends. The media love to make a bit out of that, don't they, Brad? But it's nice to see him because he's just been away and it's good to have a catch up this evening. And let me also just make a little joke about that Lord Mayor title. I mean, it trips so many people up, whether you're a Mayor or Lord Mayor and I get all kinds of titles and I answer to all of them, even the bad ones, and I laugh. And I have to say, when I go to America, people do not get Lord Mayor. They go, are you a Lord Mayor? And they go, and then they start calling me Lord Lisa. And it's just too much, it really is. So Lisa's fine and we all know what I do. And uh, anyway, it's wonderful to see so many people here this evening and to think that you are so interested in your city. And we have so much to be proud of right now. I mean, our city is going through such an amazing time. I am so proud to be the Lord Mayor of the city. I don't take credit for it all. Please don't think I do. I just think I'm really lucky to be in this role at this time because there is definitely an alignment of stars right now for Greater Perth and I include Fremantle in that because there is just so much positivity. There is a realisation that we just need to all pull together in the right direction. And it's a kind of now or never approach, but I also refer to it as our own bell epoch. And we are just experiencing an incredible time that I think in years to come, we will look back on, if we're still alive, we'll look back on it. Otherwise, future generations will look back on it and say, what an incredible period of time for development that was in Perth's evolution and, and Perth's recent history. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here this evening and it is really uh, great to focus on a forum that is really looking at being more environmentally minded about Perth and the future of Perth. And let me also disclose up front, I am not an expert in this field, but I certainly endeavour to provide a non-technical leadership perspective, uh, I suppose, uh, and in reference to the City of Perth on this topic. And it's fair to say that I will discuss some of the challenges and the opportunities that arise from the City of Perth's context and certainly as a capital city, local government share with you our council's vision for a sustainable city of Perth and how we are working very hard, let me assure you, very hard to turn our vision into a reality. So to make it uh, you know, a deed rather than just a talking point. 
and let's see if I can do the slide thing as well. Yep, there we go. So the city of Perth is a capital city and it's a local government authority with a mere 8.2 square kilometre area. It's a very small capital city by comparison to Melbourne and Sydney, which are about 36 square kilometres and 26 square kilometres, comparatively speaking. Being a capital city, Perth is a highly urbanised area with a daily workforce in excess of 110,000 people and we have a rapidly growing residential population as well, currently around 18,949 to be precise and expected to increase to over 30,000 by 2029. And when you think that we've come from about 5,000 in the early 90s, that's been very rapid growth. By ABS standards, Australian Bureau of Statistics, we are the fastest growing local government authority by percentage terms in Australia and certainly major residential and commercial developments taking place over the next 20 years are going to be significant contributing factors to the city's rapid growth. As you know, we've got Riverside uh, down near the causeway coming online. We've got Perth City Link, which is near the arena and the bus station, rapidly taking shape. And that will be fantastic to see the barrier that occurred between the city and Northbridge uh, removed once and for all. And of course, Elizabeth Key, also known as the Waterfront. And I'm guessing if you're pro Perth in this room, you are very supportive of Elizabeth Key and realise the need for more urban infrastructure density and smarter living. The global movement of people from rural areas to cities and their subsequent densification means that cities are increasing in their significance in terms of their contribution to global warming and climate change. This is a global phenomenon and as you can see um, it says their cities produce up to 75% of the world's total greenhouse emissions but actually cities globally are representing about 75% of the world's population and that is increasing as more and more people leave regional locations to become city dwellers themselves. The highly urbanised context of the city of Perth presents another challenge. The Centre for International Economics, as you can read there, uh, and uh, has stated that uh, commercial and residential buildings, no, it doesn't read there, sorry, that commercial and residential buildings are responsible for around 23% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. This is certainly a major challenge, but we also see it as an opportunity. For example, Perth Central Business District, more than 1.3 million square metres of commercial office space, and that's growing. By improving the NAVA's energy rating of that space from, say, just two to four stars, CBD emissions could be reduced by almost 76,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum. With such significant growth and development expected over the next 20 years, as I've said, the City of Perth truly understands that this must take place in a very sustainable manner. And we are working very hard on that. We have many staff working in that area. When considering the ways that we can meet this challenge, it is important to have a very clear vision of where we wish to be and by when. So, what is before you now is part of the City of Perth's vision of the type of future that we want for our community. While by its very nature, it is aspirational and high level, it needs to be, but it provides the strategic framework and the impetus for informing policy initiatives and practical on the ground action. The City's environmental actions are informed by the strategic plan and its guiding principle. These two specific guiding principles assist in ensuring sustainability is considered and is certainly instituted into the decision making by the Council of the City. Certainly when we look to improve uh, environmental performance, there is no better way than leading by example. And I believe very wholeheartedly that the City of Perth is aiming to do that across a number of uh, benchmark areas. The city has been on this journey of improvement for a number of years and the first step has certainly been to improve uh, energy and water efficiency of Council House and you know we've certainly improved in that in a huge way. I'm not sure if that's the end of the slides. The City of Perth was highly lauded for the urban design framework in 2010 that we actually produced 
and uh, this has been held up. It actually was uh, front page newspaper, as you well know. You don't get a front page unless you really deserve it in this town. And uh, so this one was really upheld as being something to really, uh, you know, work closely with. And it's been certainly uh, taken on board by a lot of uh, key developers and people working in that space as a document uh, through which they now use as basically a blueprint for the work they're doing. Also, we work very strongly uh, with the community in focusing on how we can uh, encourage key corporate tenants to be more efficient in their energy usage. The City Switch is something I'm very proud of. I try and go to all of the City Switch events that the City does. We call them the Cafe Series events and we sign up corporate signatories who decide that they want to be a part of focusing on energy conservation and smarter use of energy within their offices. And as I alluded to earlier when I spoke about the square metres of commercial tenancy space that it represents, when we get signatories, obviously they can um, sign up and take on energy saving initiatives by being signatories and really focus on how they can ensure they turn off the lights when they go home at night, turn off the computers or whatever they can do. Each little bit helps to obviously save as much energy as they can within their offices. City Switch is a national initiative. It's actually operating in each capital city, but I'm proud to say that the City of Perth's targets are well ahead of what we'd forecast them to be in the City Switch business plan. Uh, I think just in closing, I would say that uh, we're only as good as the individuals who get behind us with these particular programs. We appreciate your engagement and your interest in these kinds of initiatives because we know if we are to work smarter uh, and live more sustainably, we need to focus on increasing urban density and we need to encourage each and every one of you to do your little bit. I was just on Howard Sattler this afternoon and you know they were talking about the bicycle plan that we've just released having had it go through uh, public consultation. And, you know, everyone's bemoaning the traffic congestion at the moment, but I still see a lot of people commuting in cars solo. No one carpools. No one makes a conscious decision that, okay, they might have to pick up the, three, the kids two or three days of the week. They might have a doctor's appointment on Thursday, but maybe one of the days they could actually use public transport or two of the days they could ride a bike or actually share a car with their mate next door who's going in the same direction. And we've got to start having more and more of these conversations to really make the difference that we need to have because we shouldn't need to contain the population growth that is going to deliver the skilled labour that we need so desperately in this city to fulfil all the jobs that we need to fulfil on the back of the mining and uh, strong growth we have in so many economic sectors right now. So we need to be the change that we want to be. And as it says, our world deserves the benefit of the doubt. So I'll leave my presentation at that. I'm sure I've taken my 10 minutes and then we'll do more with the chat later on. Thank you very much for listening. Informative presentation. Our next speaker is the mayor of Fremantle, Brendan Bedding. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here with Lisa and, and, and sharing the stage. It's actually the first time in quite a while we've managed to do this, so it's really, really exciting. So, um, sustainability in Frio, it's such a, a big topic, and um, I'll, I'll just try and r run through it. I was just going to in truth, we need to call it things you could cover. So I'll, I'll just provide you a bit of a snapshot, but I think it's the questions and the discussion that we'll have afterwards that's probably the most interesting bit. So I'll, I'll go through each of these, but just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, you're certainly not everything that we're doing, and um, you'll have a bit of a, a sense of it. I mean, at the, probably I mean, the biggest challenge, and perhaps the biggest challenge we'll all face over the next century is going to be that transition towards a low-carbon economy. And it's something that we've taken really seriously at Fremantle, saying, well, well, what are the global targets and how do we actually make sure that we do them and actually set an example? So, simply, we've got a new low carbon city plan, which I recommend it's on our website. The targets for that are, I just remember here exactly, but I think it's 30% by 2020, um, could be even 40, and 80% by 2050, and actually having a really clear plan to get there, which is pretty, which is pretty challenging. Um, 
we are carbon neutral, and that's actually kind of easy because you can do that through offsets. The real challenge is actually how you do that in terms of actually producing your own energy and actually taking your community with you and, and reducing your, um, the carbon footprint of your whole community. One of those ways is actually saying an ongoing commitment by the council to put around about 1% of our rates into a low carbon city fund, which we then use to basically invest in renewable energy and those kinds of things. And there's just some examples there in terms of um, solar and, and wind, wind pods. And, I mean, and then that's in addition to some of the great stuff that the community's doing. I can see a few people here from the Fremantle Wind Farm who have worked, who are trying to persuade our Port Authority to put um, wind turbines down there, which certainly has the council's support. So it's those kinds of joint initiatives that I think are really important in the energy space. Lisa talked about density and the importance of that, and I really wanted to drive that home. It's one of those kind of forgotten parts about sustainability, and often one of the more contested parts. And what the City of Perth's done in terms of totally transforming Perth, I don't know if I'm old enough now to remember going to Perth on a, you know, after hours and it would just be nobody there, to actually a place where people can play and importantly live um, after five o'clock is, is, is absolutely vital. Because every person we get living around transit who don't, don't, don't need to drive their car to work every day is actually also one person who doesn't need to bulldoze our coastline from Dunsborough to Dombra, which seems to be the current approach that we're taking. And that's, and that's actually really key. So um, Fremantle has a long way to go on this and we've started a rather controversial, I would say, but I think very important process of getting Gate City back into the heart of Frio. It's an amazing stat that somehow we managed not to grow our population for 40 years. Um, it takes a kind of an achievement in some ways. But, um, but also that photo, which I quite like, because if you drive down that entrance across the old bridge in the Fremantle now, it kind of looks the same. <laughs> and that, I think, says something. So, um, so part, of, part, of, part of the reason for that was that Council really said nothing could be above three floors. I don't quite know why that figure was there. So we've we've pretty radically changed that. So as you drive in, and this, this is an area which is up, can be up to seven, and as you get closer into the city, it gets a bit more dense. But it's not it's not Perth density because we're not a CBD, and we, we we are we are a different kind of place. But the idea that we could get probably about three, possibly four thousand people living in the inner city, and you get a sense as you get closer in, this is our new scheme amendments away from the heritage areas, it's really important. You kind of need to keep your heritage areas and that's one of the things I love about Fremantle is we, we have a really nice heritage precinct but we've got a lot of pretty ugly stuff as well that we can happily put a bulldozer through. And um, so so that's, that's part of the plan. But we've we've kind of said to those landowners, look, we're willing to give you ex extra density, but this is, this is an, actually a bit of an agreement with, with you, is that the more density you get, it's performance-based. So you'll get, for extra floors, you have to provide both great design in an urban sense, but also actually green building. So we've got a base um, policy. We wanted to put it in our scheme, but the West Australian Planning Commission wouldn't let us, of having a minimum of four star green star. But if you want to, but as you go higher, it goes to five and six star. Um, so actually really and that incentive base around basically carrots and sticks. But, um, and I guess the other thing which I've got to put on the slide also is also having to provide affordable housing. So we've mandated in our scheme that affordability is built into every development, both and, and a range of affordability from social housing all the way through to key worker housing in terms of smaller dwellings, aiming it so that actually our policemen and our nurses and our teachers can actually live in our centres again. There was an amazing article a couple of months ago where 90% of Perth's suburbs, your know, average person on average salary can't afford to buy in anymore, which is a pretty, a pretty crazy situation that, that, that we've got into. So this is the kind of scale that we're talking about. And I guess that, that, I just want to make that distinction between I think what's appropriate in a Perth CBD to what's appropriate in a, in a heritage city like like um, Fremantle. So you've still got that, that kind of European height, Berlin, Paris, Siena, which is in that, in that picture there, with the occasional small witch jutting out. Um, and also small dwellings. This is one thing I'm really proud of that we have done, is that we've said that without planning approval, as of right, if you want to put a small dwelling of 60 square metres or less in your backyard, you can go and do that tomorrow. Long, and as long as it's got, as long as you've got a building licence and your block meets a certain size. It's pretty straightforward, but what that can do is all of a sudden, instead of us building the biggest houses on the planet, which is what we're very good at doing in Perth, we can actually uh, encourage people to build small dwellings in their backyard that can add to that diversity and affordability back into our urban centres. Transit. A big one, and again, um, 
an on a key ongoing issue for the future of Perth where we haven't invested adequately in this. There's been some great investments in heavy rail. The next stage is going to be, I think Perth is going to be more sustainable as a major investment to light rail. And it's really exciting to see the Mirror Booker announcement as the first stage, and I hope hopefully we'll see some more flow out of that in, in terms of the knowledge arc. Down in Frio Way, um, we're pretty clear that the only way the Fremantle is going to work into the future, and especially I'll just show you another slide, which is a proposal of Coburn Coast, which is just to our southern border, which is part of it's in the city of Fremantle, part of it's in the city of Coburn, um, where 10 to 15,000 people will be in that area. Now, if they want to drive to Fremantle, that's going to be an absolute disaster. But if we can actually get proper transit linking them in, it'll actually be very good for the vitality. So this is what we're, what we've actually done is said that we've actually mandated corridors that can only be used for that purpose so that we don't plan good transit planning out of our existence and are lobbying very hard to actually make sure that that can happen and it actually then gets the densities around it. As Lisa was also saying, bikes are very important. Um, I've just come back from Copenhagen, which was extraordinary. I don't know if people who's, who's been to Copenhagen, but it was totally, I've never experienced anything like it. More people ride to work every day than drive. So you've got 36% of the population and only 29% driving. And in fact, it was, it was likely not on the freeway, but a freeway with bikes. So um, it was, you, know, you have to signal and you can't go slow. Um, and it was amazing. And I mean, what I would like to see is that I think Perth, so compared to that 36%, Perth 1.2%. Um, and that um, down from 1.8 in 2000. So we're actually, I mean, there's been a little bit of a kick up possibly in the last two years, but we really need to turn that around radically. And that's it's about a very simple thing. It's about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. People have got to feel safe and comfortable and it's got to be convenient and pleasurable to ride. So one of the key things we're doing is just investing a lot in bike lanes, bike parking, inter-trip facilities to make sure that it's actually fun and convenient and safe to ride around through. The other bit about sustainability, which I just wanted to mention briefly, is actually about a good, sustainable place is also a place that enables community, or people to come together and actually have a sense of place and space. Um, and Perth's actually done this really well in a number of places, and I think well, some of the things I've seen happen around both William Street and, and Northbridge, and even some of the fantastic works around Brookfield Plaza actually recently, I've just been really impressed with. And I guess what we've trying to do it in our squares, which are often places that people didn't feel safe and didn't want to hang out in, is actually create them as places that people do want to spend time in. That's simple things like free Wi-Fi, you know, having an out outdoor reading room, you know, so your library comes outside, free tables and chairs, and we actually, we actually leave out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and surprising how few you're missing. You get the occasional person walking down the road with them. But, um, but our rangers bring, bring them back. Um, and free ping pong, and those kinds of things actually start to cr create places where community can gather, where people aren't just in their houses, is actually those great public food spaces. Finally, waste. Perhaps Lisa, you agree that occasionally we want to recycle our councillors, but, um, but, but, but most, no, I've actually got a very good council. Um, and, um, but, but waste is a really, a really important one, how we do that. Um, I mean, there's a long way to go, and this is actually where we need state government to really show proper leadership on that. Um, I think we've got some really good schemes, like the South Metropolitan Regional Council and other regional councils that are doing great re uh, recycling and, and other ways capture, but still too much is going to landfill, and the landfill levy should be used to reduce waste, not, not, not for general revenue. But, um, but we've just started commercial recycling, for example. So every business in Freer can get one of those bins and we'll pick it up for free. Um, and just as a way of actually it, uh, encouraging free commercial site recycling within our city centre. This is not free metal sadly, this is uh, Malmo in Sweden where I was just was as well. We don't quite have green roofs of that scale yet, but uh, this is one of the things actually, actually a really interesting project which I just thought was worth mentioning. We've actually got, in partnership with all three universities, um, we are doing a green roof, green wall you know, research project around how do, how do we create green roofs and walls for the West Australian climate? And actually trialling a, a, a range of those in, in Fremantle as, as we speak. So that, that's quite exciting. And um, because I think my sense is that the next generation of great urban design and great spaces is going to include those kinds of things, those green walls and, and green roofs that have a, a range of benefits from biodiversity to insulation to actually just creating a great urban building. So we're pretty excited about that project and you'll see a few of those roll out in Frio over the next little while. So, just to wrap up, our vision is for a fair that's got lots more people in it, 
and but, but with that, it's part of more affordability and more diversity in terms of that housing as well. Having a place where you can live and work and play in one place, like Perth, I think, has made a really amazing transformation over, over the last few, few years. Um, and I think Fremantle needs to do that again much more so that people who can afford to live there also can work there and play there. So you don't have to always have to travel and, and, and go to shopping malls for all the things you need. Um, and also that transition towards a low-carbon city is absolutely important. So that's kind of where we're going. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I didn't get to mention, but happy to have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Um, we have two microphones right here in the middle for whoever wants to ask questions. Please do. Just walk to the microphone and ask your question. Say your name and keep it short. Um, my name's Chad Walsh. Uh, as an American, I'd like to say hi to Lord Lisa. <laughs> um, I actually have a question in regards to slightly a different perspective on sustainability. It seems like you guys covered all of the normal bases and it seems like there's some really good work going on. Um, my definition of sustainability is also involving the fact that the city needs to sustain itself economically and there needs to be a lot of smart people doing really smart things in the private sector and education, all that kind of stuff. Um, for the first time in human history, most people in the world live in cities and the connectivity from social media, all that kind of stuff, seems to be bringing everyone together in new and interesting ways. Most people in the room have a computer in their pocket that's more powerful than a computer from six or seven years ago. And so I'm curious if there's any um, initiatives that you guys know of, of taking the huge amounts of data that are available publicly and freely, social media and whatnot, and integrating that into connecting the city and uh, really integrating you know, the community into communicating with the industries and trying to make sure that the sustainability is like a kind of crowdsource, so to speak. Because it seems to me like a lot of the stuff- I love everything you say. And any of you who have followed what I've been trying to do in the last year, I'm a big advocate of having more free Wi-Fi in the city. And we're starting from a very small base. You know, I am fortunate enough to travel in this role. And I have to tell you, when I'm away, I never pay for uh, Wi-Fi in a hotel, and yet they have the audacity to charge our inter interstate and international visitors 20, 30 bucks a day in a hotel room. I tell all the GMs here, you've got to get rid of that cost, build it into the room rate. It just shouldn't happen because the connectivity with Wi-Fi of you know being able to promote tourism, shopping, restaurants, and all of the other services just makes smart economic development sense for a city. So I'm a huge fan. I, again, don't know enough of the detail, but I know it is a smart way for a city to operate, and we really need to get right in on this. I'm very much into um, social media myself, Facebook and Twitter, and I see the benefits from first-hand experience of showing people what my role involves. And I know that as we interact and connect with each other, we're all learning more, we're all starting to click onto new ideas that can drive so many wonderful things for the city. I know it's a simplistic answer because I'm not the technical expert in it, but I get what you're saying. But we need to start talking this issue up to really force many other players in the game, stakeholders, who can make a difference to come on board with that kind of thinking. So, you know, all power to you for bringing it up. Brad, do you want to add? Well, I, I mean, I agree that, I mean, in fact, what, it is interesting, as you say, when you go overseas in that sense of, you know, in fact, the thing that the connectedness that you do get, and, I mean, and it does, it transforms public places, and that's why I gave the example of King Square, where free Wi-Fi all of a sudden transformed that dead public space actually into one that, that, that people used. Part of your question, I think, is an interesting one, because at a mayoral level, it's part, it actually thinks the state government policy question as well, around actually creating a creative capital, those kind of places that, attract creatives to actually where people want to stay and it's that fundamental question that WA question about life beyond the boom actually how do we start to really really, really capture that um, all I know is that we've really got to start thinking about that and we've really thought about that for how do we start to attract down attract in back into our center those creatives that we want to see and I know that, that Lisa's got, got similar thinking on that because that is what's going to be the future of Perth because um, the mining thing's not going to last forever yeah and I just add you know 
because we don't get to read a lot of the great stuff that's actually going on in this city, for whatever reason, we won't go into that tonight, the fact is there is so much fantastic stuff going on. I mean, this morning I opened an international conference for the World Muscle Society. There are 500 doctors in Perth at the PCEC for neuromuscular disease research. And you know, just in Perth in the last six months, doctors here have discovered new genes in fetuses have you read about this in the newspaper? Wouldn't you like to read about this in the newspaper? I mean, it's pretty cool stuff. There is a lot of creative industry stuff happening here, and there is a, a lot for us to be proud of. The general public don't get to read enough of it. That's why I love an opportunity now to share with you how fantastic you know the diversification is. It is alive and well, but we do need to keep talking it up. And so, of course, the fashion festival. You know, you see the Lord Mayor frocked up and sipping champagne at yet another fashion festival event. But I actually am championing something very worthy. Years ago, those young fashion designers would have had a hope in hell of getting a decent job here. Now, because of technology and internet capabilities, they can actually be an international designer from the comfort of home. You look at people like Aurelio Costarella, and then you look at some of the new ones like One Fell Swoop, Butcher and the Crow, uh, Stephanie Ordino et al, who are coming online. This is fantastic, but we need to be much more positive as a society and really look at the glass half full and really talk up all of these things and not knock. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Pleasure. I really appreciate it. More questions? Um, good evening, my name is uh, Raoul Eppertet. Um, Brett, thank you very much for your generous support of the Free Mental Community Wind Farm. I've got no question about the project. Um, I recently read that, um, or the question is, when you as a council are um, a carbon neutral council, I'm just wondering if you actually buy something like Green Power, and the second question to is, um, We've been recently advised by our uh, utility, publicly owned utility Synergy, that they cannot distinguish between green power and black power. So if any council claims to be carbon neutral, um, is it now black power or green power? So that's the question. How do you feel about this, um, this issue that um, Synergy has raised? Yeah, I, I understand the question. and I. They seem to distinguish quite well when they send us the bill, so um, I'm not sure why they can't distinguish the other way around. Um, now, I mean, if in fact we were originally buying green power as, as, as part of the, the, the Council's Carbon Neutral Program, we recently decided as a council to actually buy certified offsets, which were cheaper, and actually use the, the remainder of the money to invest in renewable energy ourselves, because we actually saw that as a more, in, in, in fact, because the payback it's, the price of PV, just to give you one example, has come down so dramatically over the last few years that the payback for councils, as long as you're using the power yourself in your building, is actually really worth doing. So we've actually started going down that route. Um, but I'm kind of glad that we did that before the issue that you raised occurred because I think, I mean, it was pretty bad form, I have to say, is that they can't be charging, well, charging customers green power rates and then saying they can't distinguish. WH has the lowest use of green power um, or power from renewable energy in the whole of Australia. And there's no good reason for that. In fact, um, I mean, in fact, we have the most amazing climates in terms of wind and in terms of sun for producing renewable energy in this country. And one, we should be producing it, and there is some good things happening. In fact, the big solar farm just opened up uh, up north only in the last couple of days. But there's a lot more that we could be doing, which I'd like to see in that space. Um, I'll just add a few points. I mean, uh, with the slides, I was just conscious of the time. You know, I could have elaborated on the LED lighting that we did at Council House. You know, it's actually saved money on what the traditional lighting was on the external exterior of the building with the floodlights that we had. It's LED lighting. It's also enhanced what was a very dark spot within the city from a tourism or a night time activity opportunity and yet the actual cost of running it has reduced it's only a couple of thousand dollars a year to run that beautiful colored lighting and yet look at the impact that it's had in terms of you know bringing a lot of um, happiness to many people. I get a lot of letters still about the lights there. Also um, it's fair to say that I don't know if you know I'm hoping I 
I'm telling you stuff you already know. The City of Perth is championing an affordable housing development in Godridge Street, not far from here actually. We're uh, building some key city worker units on a car park site that the city owned. Without losing the car park, we're actually decking the back of that. So the car parking is still there, but from the streetscape perspective, we are providing 48 inner city key city working key city worker units and people will have to qualify for tenancy of these and you know they'll have three year tenancy but during the time that they are tenants uh, they will be making a minimum of a 20% saving on rents compared to the market rent at the time and hopefully that is an incentive for them to save so that after their tenancy expires they then have a good uh, uh, savings to enable them to find alternative inner city or near city living and really get a taste for you know less commuting and more inner city living and let's not forget the cat buses too I mean you know a lot of these things we sort of take for granted now the whole idea with the cat buses was to really mitigate uh, short trips around the city which it does beautifully and uh, you know they're bursting at the seams now in terms of you know being so well patronized that we really want to see more and more in in case you don't know, the CAT bus is funded by the Perth Central Parking Policy. Anyone who owns city property and has more than five car bays in that city property pays a levy and it's collected to fund the CAT bus and potentially other central city transportation needs. And uh, even the City of Perth pays that uh, levy on every on-street and off-street car park that we have and we introduced recently uh, paid parking in the streets of East Perth, West Perth, which are residential areas. There was a little bit of angst from people, but if you are living in the city, you should be able to uh, you know, limit the number of cars you need, and many of those units do have one or two car bays in them, and yet we still had people griping and whinging because they were literally families with four and five cars in the one household living here in East Perth. And I had a few of them who are actually my neighbours because I live there myself. I'm like, you know, it's really nice that you've got your kids living at home and they're still at university and yes, they've got a car. But you really need to think that if they are living on a cat bus route and close to central transportation, that they should be really walking the talk and obviously abandoning a car or two and sharing a car or two and downsizing. And we all need to really think of the little ways in which we can individually start walking the talk and you know doing more. Hi, um, my name is Ali Bengal, and my um, question is related to um, Brad's. Um, you mentioned the scheme amendment recently um, that you've, that's recently gone through, and how the WAPC wouldn't approve the um, minimum four star um, green green star rating. And I'm just wondering why they refused that, and how you think that could be overcome in the future. So it's, it's a good question and it's a kind of a complex one. Um, they they refused it partly because they didn't think that the scheme should be used to mandate such things. Um, we put four star in even though we wanted five because we just wanted to test the policy, the idea. What we've, we've done, we've put it into policy, so now it is a policy that any building above three storeys, Fremantle has to, has to be minimum four star, green star. Um, which is okay, but the problem with policy is that it can be appealed. You can, you can take a policy to the State Ministry Tribunal and say, oh, I don't want to comply with that and here's my reason. By putting it into your scheme, it's locked in and it's mandatory and everyone knows. And our view is, well, give us an example of when a more sustainable building is not a good idea. And, if it's an, and I, I couldn't think of one. So on that basis, our view was it should stay in the scheme. Um, but we have, look, unfortunately, we have, I'm a bit frustrated about the lack of coherency and leadership not just at a state level, it's at a national level around green buildings. Green buildings are the lowest hanging fruit in terms of actually reducing our carbon emissions. And unfortunately, we're just not seeing that kind of leadership that makes sure the next generation of buildings is actually going to reduce both the, the carbon and, and water footprints. Uh, yeah, what I would add is, I mean, Brad's just talking about new developments uh, having that rating. <coughs> then we've got to actually start seriously talking about a retrofit of all the existing built. Uh, form building stock that exists, which you know, some of the conditions there are you know, with small amendments, you could have huge gains in terms of you know the savings that would be made. But we're not even well, we are discussing it at the city of Perth, and we're really looking very closely at that. But again, even on a national level, um, it's still not a high enough priority. Thanks, thanks, Brad and Lisa. 
I'm Pete Best from over the river in South Perth. We've got a beautiful view of the city of Perth and we're just a short bicycle ride from Trio. Um, love your work. I really would like to hear some tips about how, how you carry the people of Perth and Fremantle along with you. I, I love the work, the work you're doing. How do you get the energy of the population along with you? Well, some days you do and some days you don't. <laughs> but you just have, honestly, this is my pet subject at the moment. I can really tell you, I went to something that changed my life in August this year. It was actually in um, UCLA and it was a leadership course for young people and I had the great honour to actually take 21 young Western Australians who were scholarshiped by my friend Dr Dorfman to do this leadership school course. I got as much out of it as those 21 year old kids did and it was really taking a more positive attitude and you might, if you're on my Facebook or you've read the paper today, start to see, we've got to be kinder. We've got to be more positive as a society. We've got to uphold and champion positive a hell of a lot more than we do. We're 22 million people and for whatever reason, talk poppy, negativity, costs of living, I don't know what it is, we tend to be a little bit harsh on ourselves and a little bit down. We have so much to be grateful for. We have such a great nation. We are a science leading nation. We are a top 20 world economy. We just need to start talking more positively and not be caught up with the crap that really is blinding us right now. And so I, I tell you, I'm not gonna be the Lord Mayor of Perth forever. I have to make the most of the term that I am lucky enough to have, and I don't let the turkeys get me down. I am out there every day doing the best I can while I've got the honor of this role. And I mean that 100%. There is so much right about Perth. We know we are the world's best kept secret. But sadly, a lot of the kids here don't know how bloody lucky they are. You know, I have the good fortune to go to China and other countries where I see kids really fighting to get into our universities and fighting to get a chance to get a great education. And a lot of the time our kids get that great education and take it for granted. We just need to be so positive and really be championing people who are trying to make a difference. And everyone in this room by even being here tonight is trying to make a difference. So all power to each and every one of you. But let's uphold each other. Brad and I aren't perfect. You know, we both make mistakes. We don't have the answers to everything. But if we talk through social media, if we uphold, if we share, we can all leverage and make, you know, better solutions than we can individually come up with. Because one of my favourite sayings is, individually we are but one drop, but together we can be an ocean. I'd like to follow on from that, so I <laughs> Hi. Good evening. Thanks for, for a lot of interesting thoughts here. Um, I have two, two issues, and one is probably a state or national issue, really, more than um, what a municipality can do, and that is water. I'm amazed. I come from Western Cape, South Africa, Cape Town, where we have similar issues around water as you have in Western Australia. And I'm really amazed that so little seems to be uh, uh, done around the water issues, and so little awareness is around it, and uh, that we allow ourselves to get into a quite desperate situation before we start waking up to the reality of that. That's the one issue. The second one is, is around transport, public transport, um, transit in the city. Um, I've never come across anywhere in the world where a motorbike has to pay for parking and I'm amazed to see, and, and that, is, that is the reason for parking bays in the central city of, of Perth, standing vacant in the middle of the day which could be used. It seems a, a remarkable way to discourage people getting out of their cars and getting onto motorbikes. Okay. okay, first of all on the water issue, and I'll be really quick because I know there's other questions up the back there. Last week I was invited to um, give a case study on Perth at a real estate conference in Dubai, and I took up the opportunity, all expenses paid by the way, not at the cost of the city of Perth, very sustainable for us. And it was really interesting because during that conversation, there was a session on water, and a lot of the countries that were there, Jordan and um, you know the different uh, Middle Eastern representatives, were really stressing about water, and they were talking about the inevitability of war over water, which we read about here. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing, because I thought, 
You guys think nothing about building a six-star hotel, over-engineering, they engineer before they architecturally draw anything there. It was like completely weird to me, and I thought, yeah, they're saying they're going to have a war over water. I just couldn't believe it. If anyone could build diesel plants and not worry about the cost and do all that they needed to do, they could. And yet they're not doing that. They're too busy doing their fancy architecture and all of this completely manufactured stuff. Bring it back to Perth and Australia. I mean, we're very fortunate to have two desal plants and obviously the aquifers and, you know, need to rethink about, you know, water use and water conservation uh, as we do. Uh, I'm, I'm very focused on water conservation. Within the city of Perth, uh, we are very conscious about uh, the water usage we make. We were uh, nationally awarded for the works we did at Point Fraser, where we uh, completely reconfigured the stormwater drainage and all of the works there. And even within the city, we continue to focus on that. And, you know, we use artesian uh, bores to water the gardens and we're very, very careful about the water usage we maintain there. To jump to your next question, which was the uh, motorcycle parking, we actually give free motorcycle parking down at uh, Mounts Bay Road. It's not fully taken up. And as to usage within the city, I just hark back to the fact that we are an 8.2 square kilometre local government authority. Space is at a premium. And you know what? If we gave free parking to motorcyclists, I don't think you'd see a huge number of people jump to motorcycles because a lot of people, I personally wouldn't want to be on a motorbike next to a, a big green bus myself or a silver bus, whatever colour they are these days. The reality is um, that is not going to be the change or, or cause the change that we need. Uh, also, I think with parking, we're very conscious of the fact that the city of Perth earns more than it earns more than it actually earns rates in parking revenue. We can sort of feel guilty about it, but at the same time, we turn a lot of that back into general revenue and it produces a lot of the great events and marketing and stuff that we're doing in the city, you know, the affordable housing projects, etc. What we need to do is look at future revenue streams that will offset our reliance on the parking revenue, and we are doing that. But at the same time, while Perth is so car reliant, we can't, as a local government authority of 8.2 square kilometres, be held personally responsible for the fact that the greater city is so car reliant. What I do think we need to do is actually focus on, and it's a paradigm shift to what we're thinking, we need to actually focus on encouraging people to commute to park at a certain point outside of the city and no one will want it in their backyard, it'll be the NIMBY issue. At some point they need to you know, get out of their car and then commute on cat buses or light rail or whatever it is into the central city. And obviously we need to lessen car usage into the inner city as much as we can into the future. Because what I can tell you now with the traffic master planning that I'm privy to is with the narrow streets that we've got and the competitiveness between buses, inevitably light rail, the vehicles we have, the delivery trucks and the pedestrians, it ain't all gonna fit in another 50 years, let alone 100 years. I think that kind of covered it for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take the three next questions quickly. I'm very supportive of the green initiatives and I'm sure everyone else in the room is as well. Um, how do you plan on kind of educating the rest of the public about the importance of sustainability and change? Because a lot of what I see is that people are not very supportive of it. They don't, they, they kind of have this idea they're entitled to a big house, they're entitled to drive their car. And you mentioned that even with such high parking rates, people still are willing to pay that premium to drive. And so even in the younger generation, I mean, Facebook is just bombarded with absolutely horrible things about the change in our cities. Um, and, and oh, there's very nice things as well. But I just, I just wonder how you're going to educate those people about the need to change because there just seems to be big resistance, and I don't think people under, fully understand how important it is. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I feel a bit like I feel a bit lucky in Fremantle because, in many ways, in Freo we do have a constituency who's very supportive. In fact, I mean, just to give you an example, the plastic bag. Um, that local law that we currently have out for advertising was driven by our community. The council went, great, that's what the community wants, we'll support it and get behind you and that's why it's happening. So, in many ways, I feel a little bit lucky in that regard, but I think you're right in terms of Greater Perth. There's no doubt is quite a lot of resistance and people love their cars and they love their big houses and they love their suburbs. Um, and that's, and I think, 
that's going to be one of the great challenges is how do we how do we make that transition? Part of that's going to be through pricing. That's why things like the carbon price are important. We're probably not big enough to make major changes, but but will be important. But ultimately, you've got to actually also show that a sustainable lifestyle is actually not giving up things. It's actually about a better lifestyle as well. And actually, how catching the train to work actually means and I've got a train here tonight because I get to work the whole way. It's a bit boring, but actually, get another hour of my life to actually catch up on emails. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's actually really important. I don't want to drive because I can't email while I'm driving. Um, and I mean, those kind of things about those win wins around actually sustainability, actually not having an acre of lawn out in front of your house, but actually having a native garden not only reduces your water use, it actually brings birds to your garden actually is, and it's easy to look after. I mean, those kind of wins, I think, and having a solar passive house is just cheaper to run. You know, those, for me, sustainability is about win wins, and I think that's what. We need to communicate, it's not about giving up things, and I think that's the transition we're about to make. I mean, I could add a lot, but all I'd say is there's a lot of false economy with people. Some people think buying a cheaper house out in the suburbs is smart, but in fact, then they're spending a whole lot more on petrol and poor use of their time commuting, whereas they might have found something in the city or inner city area that was maybe a bit smaller, but it had no garden, they had free time on the weekends, and they weren't commuting as far. This is a personal discussion that everyone has to have with themselves, but we do need to continually have these discussions at large, and everyone needs to start doing a little bit. And of course, as you say, there is this huge sense of entitlement in Australia, and it's not just in the sustainability uh, environmental stakes, it's in the you know, what we earn stakes, it's an in what we think we're entitled to stakes on so many different levels. And it's really sad because, again, when you're out in the real big world out there, you, again, then look at Australia from a different perspective and you realise that we need to really readdress how we think. Thank you. Uh, Lord Brad, Lord Lisa, thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, my name's Sid Tu, I'm an architect working in the city of Perth, but I'm not one of those fancy architects. <laughs> a very pragmatic question for you, uh, Lisa. I'm just wondering when the City of Perth will introduce a recycling service for commercial yes. uh, yeah. tenants. Yes, I agree. Yeah. At the moment, the City of Vincent have to Well, it's a very so. difficult issue for us, and the fact is, it's something we have spoken about. Please know that. We do do a great recycling for all of the inner city residents, and at the moment, the commercial recycling is done uh, by the buildings by private subcontracted operations. So it's not like it's not happening. But can you imagine if the city of Perth did it, having to get access, provide all the bins or whatever it is within a very tight space anyway. It's a logistical issue for us. And while there are commercial operators who can do it more astutely and smartly, it is actually the way to go. Don't think it's not happening in the city. It's just in this instance, the city of Perth isn't driving that element of that uh, commercial uh, recycling. I would say that there's six people in our office. I can't we hear can't, you. We would say that there's only six people in our office. We can't justify the cost of any commercial No, but you could really. pull together with your neighbours and try and do something yourselves like that. It's just because the city of Perth doesn't do it doesn't mean you should give up on the idea. No, and but this there, is there the are thing. several other local it's a two -way authorities street. that do offer a commercial recycling service, such as the city of Fremantle. Yeah, but yeah. they are a much bigger area and they have different issues in terms of their street widths and the amount of traffic and residential populations and other things that, you know, Brad's already shared with you. I'm not saying we can't look at it again and we won't look at it again, but the fact is in the meantime, while it's not a service, work smarter, not harder, and collaborate with some of your neighbours and be the change you want to be. Don't always just flick it back onto government to, oh, well, if you're not doing it, we don't need to do it either, because that's, again, the sort of sense of entitlement thing that the lady was also raising a moment ago. I can speak for Sydney's office of work for him. We actually take our recycling from the office back to the city of Vincent. Fantastic. To for us. Actually, <laughs> quite often. Well, there you go. So you are really taking Quite often we do it on a push bike too, which is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, I was trying to get this one quickly, but Brad, you mentioned that you're, you're pushing the operational energy efficiency of your buildings, you know, trying to get them to four-star in commercial space, which I think is fantastic. At least you, you had that pie chart, um, carbon footprint of buildings around 23%. What that doesn't show is the embodied impacts of our buildings. And there's a huge amount of energy and carbon that goes into actually building stuff. If you consider that embodied energy, you push 23 up to 35%, sometimes 45% of our carbon footprint. Buildings. So my question is, just quickly, um, we're pushing the operational energy up, which is fantastic, 
But if you knock down an existing building and rebuild to get extra energy efficiency out of it, you can actually have a perverse outcome for the environment. So my question is, are you going to start quantifying that embodied impact of your buildings and getting people to, to protect their heritage and renovate, or at least quantify before you knock down what's the benefit of going to four star versus renovating what you've got? Yep, really good question. And I mean, I think... Um, I mean, it's a great saying, which, you know, the greenest building is one that already exists in yeah. some ways, and, um, and it's true. Um, in fact, I mean, as you were saying, you can have 20 to 30 years of operational energy embodied in the energy of what that building is made up of. We're trying to get ahead. I mean, in Frio, it's a bit easier, because the reality is, except for the, the I mean, we guys are pretty ugly one-story 70s things that, that we're happy to see a bulldozer through. The question is, you know, um, in those cases, should we be trying to capture those? Probably not, but for, I'll give you one, one example which, which we have taken that seriously is the Maya building, which Maya's leading through Manor and a new store will go in there early next year. Um, before that happens, that building is going to be totally retrofitted. Now, there was talk about knocking it down, but it was pretty clear that the embodied energy in that, and the fact that it was structurally sound meant that it was actually better not to. Um, probably not quantified in the way that you're talking in that kind of mathematical sense, but there's certainly a philosophical approach is where you can retrofit, we do. We're having this debate over, over another building in the heart of Fremantle or Queensgate Cinema building, where we, do we take those cinemas and try and, and cinema operator doesn't want them anymore. Um, so how do you then retrofit a cinema? Um, and, those, and those kind of challenges, they're really, they're really tough ones. And I think the point you're raising is absolutely key. And I guess the question maybe back to you is, do you know the tools that exist to do it, and do they exist? I'm glad you asked that question, because yes. <laughs> they, they exist here in the city of Perth, on Pier Street. It's a web-based bit of software, so what you're talking about before about internet and Wi-Fi and connection, that's exactly what we do. And we make it really, really easy to answer those questions, so you're not thumb-sucking, is it better to knock it down and start again? We can help. I would just add too, the City of Perth has been championing upper floor activation and as you would appreciate, you look in the malls, you look in many, actually I was in one today, I don't know if you know where um, Wolf Lane is and uh, basically Rob Pierucci used to have a dress shop on Murray Street, it's now the Margaret River Chocolate Factory shop and Patrick Coward, the owner of that building, took me right through and Peter Bell, the footballer, has the... Uh, Barrow, oh, what, I forget the name of it, you guys probably know better than the name, the little bar at the back. I got the full tour of that building today. I mean, the whole top floor is empty. Beautiful area for potentially, you know, commercial offices. And then the whole basement area is empty and they're looking at doing something pretty amazing down there. Just cast your mind back five, ten years ago, there just wasn't the demand for city space. So, yes, I totally agree with your line of questioning, but you've also got to relate it to demand and peaks and troughs of you know, what the driving forces are, and also from a development perspective, I mean, you know, the cost of land per square metre in the city is a completely different thing to what it might be in Fremantle, and any developer is going to do their sums and know whether it is going to be viable for them to retrofit or more potentially beneficial for them to bulldoze and build. They're not that stupid because they're not going to throw money down the drain and also the banks aren't going to lend the money in this climate to do that anyway. So, you know, I understand where you're coming from from an environmental perspective, but you've also got to look at an economic perspective and a city demand perspective because we've come a long way from being a branch office economy in the late 90s to being, you know, a global city now in the 21st century. Last question, we have to go drink. Um, hi, I'm Ross. Um, my interest is in public transport and it's very fragmented. I mean, we're in a very large um, distribution. I mean, it's not like uh, when I was living in London where you had so many people per um, 100 square metres. But what I don't see in around the world as well is it's not bike friendly. Now, I can ride my bike and I can leave my bike at the train station, but I then can't ride my bike on the other end. And I'd like to see a carriage where you can literally just roll, you know, design four bikes and then, because some people work in the cities and we're you know, one and a half k away, that's a little bit too much to walk, especially in summer and vice versa, you, you know, that 1.5k. Yeah. Uh, spot on. So, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, again, sorry to tell Europe stories, but, 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 but just being in Europe and seeing all across Northern Europe, that exact thing. So the last carriage, huge bike logo kind of sprayed across it. You know, that's the carriage you can get on, and that's when you can actually People know that and to expect it's designed differently and it's designed for that. And I think a proper integrated public transport system is also one that actually integrates bikes, both on buses and on light rail and on trains. And we see it all over the world. Perth hasn't quite caught up to that yet, but 
that's one of the things. If that's not, it's not our issue, to be, to be honest with you, not, not, not to palm it off, but this group needs to put pressure on the state government yeah. to actually in, integrate that to happen. Yeah. What I would add is, I mean, we're an ageing population, and I'm sorry, you're not going to see me on a bike riding 20Ks <laughs> any day in the future. I might when I retire, let me finish, I might when I retire, because I live over here in Henry Lawson Walk, consider going to maybe Bennett Street on a bike, but I'm not going to compete with the buses and all of that. I hope that we will be able to separate the traffic, but let's be realistic with the forecast population growth and the seeming inability at the moment to separate traffic, light rail, buses and cars and all of that. It's nice, but it's not Copenhagen, okay? So let's not try and aspire to be something that we can't be, but we can improve what we've got. We can get more cycling happening and we will. And the City of Perth's bicycle plan, if you haven't read it, and please do before you comment, does actually create strong east-west routes, north-south routes, with an intention when the waterfront, the link and riverside are finished to create the bike hire um, services that we aspire to have to encourage people to be able to take bikes from precinct to precinct. But at the moment, we simply do not have the space to have those bike hire facilities. The space does not exist. But hopefully in five to eight years time, those bike hire facilities will be in existence and then they'll be complemented by ever increasing cycle lanes, responsible cycle lanes that then separate the traffic. I'm all for that. But again, at the same time, you've got to balance it with the needs of all other demographics. This, I'm sorry, just one last lucky question. If you're really quick, because our caterers are waiting for us. Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I'm, my name is Joanne Hovick. I'm really encouraged um, by um, what you're both been talking about. Can you hear me? Just. Yeah. Okay. Just. Um, That's better. That's better. Um, I, I was particularly interested in what you said about Jordan, your experience yeah. um, in Jordan, um, Lisa, and that you were amazed at the response about water and um, forecasting that there might be war, war over water and, mm. you know, talking about, you know, the, the disconnect there, building these huge hotels yeah. and so on. I find that there's the same disconnect here in Australia. Water is Australia's most precious resource. And the answer is not desa more desalination plants. Desalination plants have their issues, and just on a pure cost-benefit analysis, they are most definitely not the answer, including damage to the environment. Um, so my question, I guess, is what is being done uh, to promote um, recycled water? and conservation. Okay, okay, again, this is a state government issue. We are mere mayors of local government authorities. And again, I reiterate, I'm not an expert in the water area, but what I would say is we do need to encourage everybody to be talking about this issue and speaking about it a whole lot more. But at the same time, you know, food security and all of these things, selling off, you know, our farms to whatever country might want to buy our farms, you know, when we're looking at a forecast population growth of 62 million by 2100, uh, and we're already now producing food for about, I think it's like uh, 45 million people. We've got a population of, what, 24 million people. We're currently in a very nice position. But when our population is 62 million, if we're still only producing food for 45 million, we're going to be relying on importing the food. They're also the kinds of conversations we need to be having as a country and not allowing our farms to be sold off to the highest bidder at the time because the poor old farmer guy can't, you know, make it work anymore. The government needs to come in and subsidise and help so that we can maintain food security for the future. So I throw all these things back at you again because I'm not an expert in this area, so it's unfair to ask me a lot of these questions. But I agree with you, it's fantastic to be putting these things out there for us to even be pondering them. The very fact we're even discussing these issues shows that we care. But what, there's 200 people in this room right now? What about the other, you know, people out there that are probably, you know, not worrying about it? My, my, my two word answer is probably a dollar ten per thousand litres is a little bit cheap. So, and I think that's ultimately got to be part of the solution that's that's saying true. that we don't value our water, and it shows because it's way too cheap. But in that, and in fact, when you get your bill, most of your bills are not you're paying for water, you're just paying for the right to access it. So, I think that, that's a conversation that we need to have. It's pretty hard in this political cost of living kind of environment, but I think it's what we need to have. Thank you. Thanks to Central for such a great venue to have our mayors. 
and uh, thank to you. I uh, just wanted to remind you guys that Perth Green Drinks is a volunteer organization. It's made by us. That means you too. So if you have suggestions, questions, or anything that you want to tell us, uh, Susan and myself are just doing this right now. Wilma, who started Green Drinks, is here tonight. Uh, so just drop us a line. We're happy to chat and incorporate any suggestions that you may have. And um, please like us on Facebook. There's drinks and nipples up out there. Thanks for coming tonight.